crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame. Given at the cross. Now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath breaks as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two. Death are raised to life, finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame. Given at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds, for through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live, one through your selfless love. This the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a words there in in that song he became sin for us and we remember that now in the communion service how the one who was holy and righteous took upon himself the weight of our sin upon the cross and bore the wrath in our place what a glorious uh, good news that is and, of course, that, that um, was bought at the price of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his death, his body broken, his blood shed for us. And we're encouraged, don't we, to run the race looking to Jesus, to run the whole race looking to Jesus. And that's what we're doing now as we come to the communion service. We are, again, fixing our eyes on Jesus the one who died in our place. This is for those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are trusting in him. And if you are, if you are not a believer, then please let the bread and the, and the cups pass you by. But look at them, because they, they are for you in one sense, because they are preaching the gospel to you. They are saying there's one who died in your place, who gave his body for you, who gave his blood for you for you freely and so there's no reason why you shouldn't come 
and believe in him and put your trust in him. Paul says, on the, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you gave your body for us, that your body was nailed to a tree, nailed to that cross, that wooden cross for us. You bore the wrath. You bore the curse in our place. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So if you hold on to the, the cups as it comes round, and then we can drink together. Jesus has paid the price fully for our sins by his blood. Drink this in remembrance of him. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you came into the world to save sinners and you did that not by showing us the way to God but by being the way to God by putting yourself in our place and paying the price that we could not pay by taking our place upon that cross and bearing your, the, the wrath of God against our sin and I pray today as we as we have just now remembered your death, that those, those truths, those gospel truths, would stir our hearts. They would cause us to love you more for all that you have done 
for us. May they assure us afresh of your love, of your mercy and grace towards sinners. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. Uh, Behold our God, who has held the oceans in his hands. in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God seated on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him, who has given counsel to the any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore Behold a king, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to a grave, Jesus Saviour, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold. who we were beholding on the cross, dying in our place, is now on the throne. He's being raised to the highest place, given the name above every name. Well, I'm going to speak to the children. Any children here this morning? For a little while. Do you want to come up to the front so I can see you? Come on, up the front. I'm not, I don't bite. 
Come on, I can see you in the back. Come on, at the front. There's some prizes. Oh, that got them going, look. Come on. <clears throat> good, to, good to see you here this morning. Um, and I'm going to speak to you a little bit about... What, do you know what that says? Yep. Opposites. And do you, what, do you know what an opposite is? What's, what's opposite? What does that mean? Yeah. Something that's different. I think that's a good, that's good. Something that's totally different. That's a very good explanation. Yeah? Uh, something on the opposing spectrum. Or wow, that's a technical definition <laughs> there. Oof. I don't know about that. Yeah. Opposing. So you've used, almost used the word opposite in there. It's difficult to say. It's, I try to think about it. It's something that's opposite. But I've used the word opposite in my definition of opposite. It doesn't help. But I think that's very good. Something that's different, totally different on the other side. It's easier to think of some opposites. So I've got an opposite here. What's that say? Yeah. Quick. Are you quick? You were quick then, weren't you? What's the opposite of quick? Yeah. Slow. Who is at the back? Some at the back as well. Okay. Slow. So let's have a look. Yeah. Ooh. Slow. Quick and slow. Are you quick or are you slow? The Bible says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. The Bible's got lots of um, opposites in it. It says we're to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Some people say that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we could listen twice as much as we, as we speak. What about another one here? Somebody who hasn't answered the question, what's that say? Anyone at the back? East. East. Where's east from here? That way, is it? That way. East. What's the opposite of east? Yeah. West. Very good. I got an answer out of you. Very good. East and west. The Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our sins from us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's amazing. As far as the east, if you keep going as far as you can, that way you keep going, that's east. Opposite direction is west. Find another one here. Ah, who knows what the opposite should, Do you know what the opposite of yes is? You don't. Do you know what the opposite of yes is? What's the opposite? Do you know what the opposite of yes is? No. You don't. Does anyone know what the opposite of yes is? No. Yeah. Oh, you mean it is no. Yes, that's right. Let's have a look. The opposite of yes is, is no, yes. And the Bible says that we should let our yes be yes and our no be no. So if you say something then you should mean it. Just like God. God. When God says something, he means it. His yes is yes, and his no is no. I think we've got one more. Ah, oh, what's that word? Yes at the back? Do you know what it says? No. The front, gone, yes. Visible. Are you visible or invisible? Oh, I, oh what's the opposite of visible? Yep. Unvisible. Sort of. Invisible is the, is the opposite. Yes, have a look. Visible and invisible. Are you visible or are you invisible? What do you think? I think you're a bit of both. Yeah, you're a bit of both. I can see you, but there's some bits of you I cannot see. So God made, it says that God made all things visible and invisible. And when he made man, when he made Adam, he made him... Give him a body, but he also breathed into him a living soul that we can't see, that God can see. And the Bible says that the things that are visible are passing away. The things that are invisible are eternal. And we, we put too much importance, don't we, on the things we can see, on what we look like, and we need to think more about what we can't see. Um, any more? Was there one more? Oh, another one. What's that word say? You, you've been very helpful, yeah? Proud. What's the opposite of proud? Yep. Humble. humble. Yeah. Proud. Let's have a look. Proud. The opposite of proud is humble. And the, the Bible says that God opposes the proud. So the proud is someone who thinks, I'm brilliant. 
Ruth's proud. I, I don't need help. I'm okay on my own. He says, God opposes the proud, but gives, gives help. He helps the humble. Right, now I'm going to read something for, for you from the, from, from the Bible. And I want to see if you can spot the opposites in here, okay? It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Can you spot the opposites at the back? Come on, somebody who hasn't done help, so you've had lots of help at the front at the back? No? What's the opposites? Come on. Huh? Poverty and... Yeah. Rich and poor, or rich and poverty, but rich and poor. Can you see it there? So we can blow those words up a little bit on the next slide. He was... You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was in heaven with all the glory of God, Yet for your sake, you're in this verse, your sake, he became poor and he went to the cross so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Not rich with money, but rich in terms of eternal life, knowing God. That's amazing. Are are you poor or are you rich? Are you poor or are you rich? I'm not talking about money. Well, Jesus Christ came so that we might be rich, so we might know him and know God and have a place in, in heaven. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? So we read this verse out together. Let's read this verse out together. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Yeah. Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. He left aside all his glory. He humbled himself and became poor so that we who are poor and all we have is our sin might become rich, might know the riches of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. So we thank you for that wonderful wonderful truth. I pray for the children as they go out to their classes now. Please help them to listen carefully. We pray for those who will be teaching them. Help them, we pray. May they have the joy of seeing some of these young children coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So we're going to sing um, again. This is Amazing Grace. And my chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that took my heart to fear, and grace How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior.
Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. chapter 11, um, reading from verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And then if we go down to verse 16. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And then at verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then these are the, word, the verses that we'll be focusing on this morning. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your living word. Thank you that we have it here this morning in our own language, that we're able to read it together, that we're able, free, to meet in this way, to, to worship you, to sing your praise, to pray and to study your word together. What an amazing privilege that is. And as we do that freely this morning, we, we remember our brothers and sisters in, in different parts of the world where they meet in very different circumstances. Those who are meeting in secret, those who are unable to meet because they are imprisoned for their faith, families that have been separated. Lord, we, we are told in your word to remember those in chains as if we were chained with them. And Lord, I pray that you will forgive us that so often we forget to do that. And we, we remember now before you our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for their faith. We pray that you would strengthen them, that they might know that you are with them, that you are near. Uphold them, we pray. May they be able to call to mind the the wonders of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you are not limited um, and that you can meet your people wherever they are, whether on their own or in twos and threes or in large groups. We, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who is everywhere and that you meet with your people. We pray that we might know you here with us this morning. We come and we, we plead alone the blood and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would graciously meet with us. And as we look at your word, we pray that it would do us good. We pray that it would, it would um, get right into our, into our hearts and into our souls. That it would penetrate bone and marrow and do us good. Thank you that you know us, that we come before the God who knows every one of us. You know exactly where we are, what we need, the difficulties we're facing, the struggles that we're having. We thank you that you know us. Um, and so we pray that you would graciously take your word and apply it to the needs of each one. We pray that you would build us up in our faith. Help us to, to go out of here um, out of this building, knowing we've met with you and with a, with a stronger determination to, to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ in the week ahead. Uh, thank you that you know what we'll be facing in the coming week. We don't know what the next hour will bring, but you know the end from the beginning and you know what we'll be facing. And so please, from your word, equip us, make us ready for all that we will face and, and help us then to, to, to live our lives in whatever we do, in, in just simple things like eating and drinking, in work, at home, whatever we do, help us to do it all to your glory, to glorify you. I pray for the church here. Thank you for the work here that you have sustained over, over many years. And I pray for the people here that you would bind them together with cords of love, which cannot be broken. Build them up in their faith, strengthen them. We pray you would add to their number. May they have the joy of seeing 
people being saved, people being baptised and joining here. And may they, may they have the joy of seeing some of these children who are here this morning. Thank you for them. Thank you for their young lives. May they come as, as little children to, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For of such is the kingdom of God. So we pray for them. And now we pray for ourselves. Help us now as we come to your word. I pray you would help me to be faithful to your word. Help me to speak clearly. Um, and above all, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would be here to take that word and apply it with power and conviction to our hearts and minds. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to um, just read those last three verses again. Wonderful verses. In some senses, it seems a pity to preach on them because they're just so wonderful on their own, so clear. But um, you've asked me to come and preach, and so I will, I will preach on those verses. Here, here are the verses. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, imagine that you are unwell. For some of you, that might be easier than for others. Imagine that you're unwell. You're very unwell, so unwell that you want to go and see the doctor. And so you book an appointment at the doctor's. And you go along at the right time. You go in, you sit in the waiting room. And you get called in. And so you go into the doctor's room. You sit down in a chair. And the doctor says, here you are. Here's the prescription. Take it to the chemist. Or here's some tablets. Go and take these, one of these three times a day. What would you think? of the doctor. You think, they're crazy. You want them to ask you some questions first of all, don't you? What, what's wrong? What are your symptoms? You wouldn't go back to that doctor again, I guess. You think they were mad. You want them to ask, what, what's wrong with you? How are you feeling? And then they would diagnose the problem and then give you an appropriate prescription. Well, I'm going to be a bit like that crazy doctor this morning. Because I don't know you very well. I know some of you a little bit. But I don't know you. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know if you're a Christian or not a Christian. I don't know if you're a Christian who's doing well or a Christian who's backslidden or anything in between. And yet I know that these verses are what you need. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you need to hear these verses. There's so much in these verses. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface. But what I hope is that you'll, you'll be excited enough to go away and spend more time looking at these verses and thinking about them. These verses are for you, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. We all need to hear these words. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I want to think, first of all, about the call and make some observations about the call. Come to me. And then I want to spend some time thinking about the caller. Who is me? Who is it who's calling? So first of all, let's think about the call. Come to me. The first thing I want us to know is this is a direct call to you. A direct call. These are the words... Um, these words were written by Matthew, but they're not Matthew's words. Matthew recorded the words. They are the words of Jesus. This is not the words of Matthew saying, go to Jesus. They're the words of Jesus saying, come to me. Do you see the difference? It's a direct call. I don't want you to go away thinking, I heard the preacher say, go to Jesus. I want you to go away thinking, I heard Jesus say, come to me. 
because that's what we have in these words in this verses. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus is speaking to you this morning. Come to me, he says. It's amazing, isn't it, that these words, these words were spoken 2,000 years ago. I don't know how many, 2,000 miles away. I'm not sure how far this is from Potton. Um, but we have them here recorded for us this morning. We can hear the words of Jesus. And why, why is that important? Why is it important to note that, that this is a direct call? It's not me saying to you, go to Jesus. It's Jesus saying to you, come to me. I think there's all the difference there, isn't there? If someone says to you, come to me, you know they want you to go to them. They mean it. It's a direct call. When our children were young, sometimes Sam and Dan, my oldest two boys, would be downstairs playing, and we might send Lucy out to them and say, tell them that we want them to come in. And sometimes they would think we didn't really mean it, and you have to go down afterwards. And I would have to go down and say, come in. Direct. You see, difference. When I go down, they know I mean it. And Jesus says directly to you this morning, come to me. And therefore there can be no doubt that he means it. There's no doubt. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus doesn't say, Have his, let his yes be no and his no be yes. He, his yes is yes and his no is no. When he speaks, he means what he says. And so he says, come to me, and he means it. In fact, he's more ready to receive you and to welcome you than you are to go. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus lamented, he wept over Jerusalem. He said, how I long to gather you to myself like a hen gathers their chicks, but you were not willing. But Jesus is willing. Jesus says, come to me. It's a direct call. And secondly, it's a gracious call. Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all who are good and righteous and religious and upright, respectable, holy, come and get what you've earned. Come and get what you deserve. That's not what Jesus says. And thank goodness it's not what he says, because there are none righteous, not even one. Rather, Jesus says, what does he say? Come all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not going to sell us rest or give what we've earned. He's just going to give it free. He's calling those who are weighed down and burdened. The picture that comes to mind is, this is John Bunyan country, isn't it? Comes to mind is Pilgrim's Progress and Christian. I don't know if you know the story of, of Pilgrim's Progress and Christian. There's the man at the beginning who's got this great big burden on his back and he's weighed down. And that burden is all his sin and his guilt. And he can't get rid of it. He feels the weight of his sin. And that's who Jesus is calling. Come to me, all you who are weighed down and battered and broken, full of sin. And I will give you rest. This is not a call to the righteous to get their reward. Rather, Jesus calls sinners to receive a free gift. Jesus said... Those who are well have no need of a doctor. So again, if you went to the doctor, booked an appointment and went in, and this time he said to you, what's wrong with you? And you said, nothing, I'm fine. Well, then he would think you were crazy, wouldn't he? The those who are well don't need a doctor. Jesus says, but those who are sick do. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. 
Jesus calls sinners to come to him. Church isn't for good people. There was a pastor I know in, in, who was in Newport, and they used to go out into, the, into the, the bad areas of the city and speak to the, the prostitutes and the drunks, and they, would, and they would say, come to church, come to church. And they would say, oh no, church is for good people. And he said, no, no, church is for bad people. And that's what Jesus says, come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, who are just full of sin. And gracious, Jesus graciously calls sinners to freely receive rest, forgiveness. And that's an encouragement to us, isn't it? To come to him, to listen to that call. Maybe you're, you're not a Christian, you think, or you're a backslidden Christian, and you think, I've just got too much sin. I've just got too much sin. I, I can't, it's stopping me, I can't go. But that's wrong. Jesus says, that's what you need. You, you come with your sin. Don't try and smarten yourself up. Don't try and do some good deeds to sort of earn a bit of favor. This isn't a call of merit. It's a gracious call. And we go on like that through the whole Christian life. If you're a Christian here this morning and you're, you're doing well, you're, you're, you're on fire, you might say. Still, you come to Jesus on the terms of his grace, not on the terms of how well you're doing, on your performance, of how much you prayed or read the Bible this week. I've done well, I can go to Jesus this week. That's not how we go. Throughout our whole lives, we go, come to him, we go to him on the basis of what he has done and what he is like, his mercy and grace. There's that great hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me let me hide myself in thee that's go to jesus hide yourself in him it says nothing in my hand i bring simply to the cross i cling naked come to thee for dress helpless look to thee for grace foul i to the fountain fly wash me savior or i die and that's the song for the whole christian Life, not just when you come. The first, it's this song for the whole Christian life. So there's a great encouragement for us to hear that call and to go. It's a gracious call, and then it's a call to repentance. Jesus says, "Come to me, all who labour." And a heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is a call to come as we are with all our sin, all our guilt, and to humbly and willingly submit ourselves like little children to him and to his teaching. The yoke in the Bible is used as a picture of service. Sometimes that was good, sometimes bad. Um, I'm a bit wary of telling, uh, we've got farmers here, what a, what a yoke is. But anyway, a yoke was a wooden frame that was put across the back and necks of ox, of a pair of oxen, and then that would be used to, to draw. They would then pull along, maybe a plough, in the service of the farmer. And the, in, in the Bible, that's used as a... There's a picture of serving, of service, of putting yourself under. And here Jesus says, take, take my yoke. Sometimes the yoke was put forcibly on. Israel, when they were in Egypt, were described as being under the yoke of slavery until God broke it. When Adam and Eve sinned right at the beginning, they broke one law that God had given them. And in essence, they were saying, take that yoke off. We don't want that yoke. Break the yoke. Throw it down. We don't want to have your laws. We don't want your word. We don't want you as God. That's the essence of sin. I don't know if you notice when 
King Charles III was being, the, when he had the coronation, there were some people who were protesting. And do you, do you remember what their banner was? Not my king. There were lots of them there. Not my king. And that's an that's a illustration, a, a really good illustration of what sin is. It's saying, not my king. God, not my king. I want to be king. And here Jesus is calling us back in repentance. Say, submit to me, to my, to my teaching. In other words, he's calling us to repent, to turn back. Jesus says, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this is a call to repent and to submit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve him. The favorite um, description of the apostles, if you read almost any of the letters, it says, Paul, an apostle and servant of Jesus Christ. And the, the yoke that Jesus asked us to put on ourselves, to take on, isn't a heavy yoke. He says it's light and easy. And, it, and that's, I think that's true because, one, he's there with us. He's alongside us. He bears that yoke with us. But also because the one who asks us to, to take that yoke upon ourselves and to submit ourselves to him is the one who died for us. He's the one who, as we remembered this morning, took our place. He bore our sin. He calls those who are burdened by sin, and he came into the world to bear that burden. He put himself under the yoke of God's law and lived it perfectly, and then took our place took upon himself our sin. And so the yoke that Jesus asked us to put on is a yoke of freedom. His teaching is the law of love, the gospel. His teaching is come to me, abide in me, love me, love one another. It's not like the yoke that the scribes and Pharisees put on all the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of laws, laws and laws and laws on top of laws that they put on top of the people that they so will burden them. Jesus' law, Jesus' yoke is light. And then, on, in terms of the call, the last thing on the call, notice this is a call to a person. Jesus doesn't say, go to a place or, or come to this set of commandments. He says, come to me. Come to me. He's calling us to himself. And so this is a call to a person, to a relationship, to fellowship with a person. And that's the heart of Christianity. That's the heart of what Christianity is. It's about being brought into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To come to know him. Not just knowing about him. There's all the difference in the world, isn't there, between knowing about someone and knowing someone. You know about King Charles, but do you know him? We know about King Jesus. But do you know King Jesus? Here Jesus is calling us to a relationship with him. Come to me. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me. And he's calling us to abide in him. And that's so important. If your Christianity is just about what you do and don't do, where you go and where you don't go, what you watch or don't watch, what you wear or don't wear, if that's all it is, then that's just religion. True Christianity is about a relationship. The beating heart of Christianity is this. Come to me. Come to me. God, the wonder of the gospel is it brings us back. Sin separated. Adam and Eve sinned. said, so we don't want you. God says, out of the garden. And they were separated. 
Jesus Christ came that we might be reconciled to God, brought back to God in a relationship with him. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It's all about relationship. He leads me, he guides me, he restores me. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for, why? You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. They are a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. At its heart, Christianity is about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, cultivate that. Make sure that is what your Christianity is about. It's about Jesus. And then, we're we're getting short of time, but I think it's important. We need to think about who it is who's calling us. Who is it who's calling us? It makes all the difference. We don't want to blindly respond to anyone who says, come here. We want to know, who are they? Now, if a policeman said to you, come here, you would say, oh, yeah, I'd better go. But if it's some, some strange, random-looking stranger said, come here, you might think, oh, hold on. So who is it? It makes all the difference. Who is it who says, come to me? Who is me? Well, I'm going to spend the rest of the... Of the of the day looking through the Bible, because this tells us all about who he is. Could do that, but then um, I wouldn't be invited back again. But just have a look at what Matthew chapter 11 tells us about who Jesus is. We read verse 2 and 3. It says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Are you the one who is to come? And the point I want to make here is that the one who says, come to me, is first of all the one who came to us. This isn't the voice of God thundering from heaven, come to me, because that would be impossible. We can't ascend to heaven. Sinners can't get up there to heaven. Now, this is the voice of a man. The voice of the one who was the word in the beginning with God, but who became flesh and dwelt among us. The one who came into the world. And that's a glorious truth. So the one who says to you, come to me, is first and foremost the one who came to you, came to us. He came into this world to save sinners. He came not to show us how to get up to God, how to get up to heaven, but to be the way to heaven. By taking our place, by taking upon himself our body, a body like us, and then living perfectly, obeying God's law perfectly, and then taking upon himself all our guilt, all our sin. Standing in our place, condemned sealing our pardon with his blood. So the one who calls us to come to him is the firstly the one who came to us. And so when he says, come to me, why wouldn't you go? Look at what he did for you. Won't you hear him? And then... Look at verse 19. It says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So the one who says, Come to me, all you sinners, is the friend of tax collectors. And sinners. This was the phrase that was used to describe the worst of people, the lowest in society. Tax collectors and sinners lumped together. The religious people of their day did everything they could to avoid them. They would go out their way to avoid them. They shunned them. 
They despise them. They thought that we're holy. Any contact with dirty things like those people would make us unholy. And here comes Jesus, who is the altogether holy one. And he not only does not go out of his way to avoid them, he welcomes them. He says, come to me. He eats and drinks with these people. And that's why he was given the name. It was like a, a, a name of abuse, friend of tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> it was a term of abuse, accusation from the religious leaders. But for Jesus, it was like a, a badge of honor. This is why I've come. This is right. He would go to the house of Zacchaeus and they would grumble. He's gone to the house of a sinner. When Jesus told the parables of the, the lost coin and the lost sheep and the prodigal son, do you, know, do you remember why he told those stories? Because the, tax, the Pharisees and the scribes were, were saying and accusing, look, he's welcoming sinners, he's eating and drinking with sinners. And Jesus told those parables to say, that's exactly right, and that's why I've come. I've come to call sinners. And that's why he was known as the friend. The friend. Isn't that a lovely term? The friend of sinners. He's not friendly with sin, but he is the friend of sinners. He came into this world to, to do battle with sin and death and the grave, and he won. He's not, the, he's not friendly with sin, but he is the friend of sinners. And so isn't that glorious news for us this morning? If you're thinking, I've messed up again, I've got too much sin, I can't go back. You can't go back to the friend of sinners. The one who says, come to me, is the one who calls those who are sinners friends. He's the friend of sinners. And then finally, another encouragement to go, to listen, to go. Look at what he says in verse, what, how Jesus describes himself in verse 29. How does he describe himself? I am gentle and lowly. Isn't that amazing? That the one who made all things the Lord of the universe describes himself as gentle and lowly. Gentle. He's gentle and lowly. He's like the good shepherd who goes out after the sheep that's lost. Has to go out and find him. And when he finds him, what does he do? He doesn't scream and shout at him and say, what are you doing out here again? I've had to come out and find you. What does he do? He gently picks him up. He doesn't chase him back. He doesn't say, go on, chase him back. He picks him up, puts him on his shoulders. He takes the weight. He bears the burden and he carries him home rejoicing. Instead of Jesus... That a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick or a smoking flax he will not quench. <coughs> the one who says, come to me. And you might think, oh, I can't go to him, I, I messed up again too much. It's the one who's gentle and lowly. See how gently he restores Peter when Peter had denied him three times? I don't even know him. Never heard of him. And then with oaths and curses, Jesus just so graciously and gently restores Peter. And this is a great encouragement, isn't it, isn't it to us? Don't fear to go to him. Don't fear to go back to him. He's the one who is gentle and lowly. The friend of sinners. The one who came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. Don't let your sin stop you. Sin is the very reason you need to go to Jesus. So 
So as I said, I want you to hear not my voice saying, go to Jesus. I want you to hear Jesus saying, come to me. Put your trust in him. Put your hope and your faith in him. Take his yoke upon you and learn from him, for he is gentle and lowly. His yoke is easy and his burden is light and he will give rest for your souls. That's what we need more than anything else, rest for our souls. Anything else you're searching for in life is just nothing in comparison to the need that you, need, you have for rest for your souls. And he's ready to give that, to give it, free gift to those who go to him. So please do that. Please hear, hear the words of Jesus as he says, come to me and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words these words of Jesus recorded for our good. I pray now we would not be like those who, who's, who hear and then go away and forget, but we would be like those who, who hear and remember. May these truths sink down deep into our hearts. May they encourage those who are discouraged. I pray that you would open the eyes, open our eyes to see Jesus the, the lover of our souls, the friend of sinners. And may we respond and come to him. And we need that, all of us, whether we're Christians or not, Lord, we need to be, be near the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep on coming back to him. Please, we pray, help us by your spirit. Amen. So we're going to sing um, two songs. Actually, I noticed I was looking on the website to see what time you started, and I noticed on the history of Potton that there was a formidable Mrs. Richardson, apparently, who stopped a preacher having five songs one time instead of the usual four. But Philippa has been much less formidable, and she's allowed me to have five, so thank you, Philippa. So what a friend we have in Jesus that has that lovely line, all our griefs to bear. What we can carry all... Can we go to that third? Can we go to the... That next one. The next one. Are we weak and heavy laden, burdened with a load of care, precious savour, still our refuge? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Lovely. And then we'll sing Christ our hope in life and death. What a friend we have in Jesus. Our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often. Do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, burdened with a load of care? Precious Saviour, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer.
that is our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all times and now and forever amen